years the storm is coming fast the day will soon be here when those who are caught unprepared will be the first to fall that much is clear hello and welcome to physical attraction the tale to wow key specials but we'll be examining the end of the world one apocalypse at a time and survive while there's people crying, people dying everywhere around. One of the things that it's very easy to forget, of course, while you're writing about the end of the world, is that it's already happened. In 1348, Agnolo di Tura was living his life as a shoemaker and tax collector in the beautiful town of Siena in Italy. He was a literate man, which was pretty unusual at the time and liked to describe the goings-on in Siena, as well as his own life, his marriage, and his five children. And then, in that year, he witnessed the end of the world. Quote, Father abandoned child, wife husband, one brother another, for this illness seemed to strike through the breath and sight, and so they died. And none could be found to bury the dead for money or friendship. Members of a household brought their dead to a ditch as best they could, without priests, without divine officers. Great pits were dug and piled deep with the multitude of dead. And they died by the hundreds both day and night. And as soon as those ditches were filled, more were dug. And I, Agnolo de Tura, called the fat, buried my five children with my own hands. And there were also those who were so sparsely covered with earth that the dogs dragged them forth and devoured many bodies throughout the city. There was no one who wept for any death, for all awaited death. And so many died that all believed it was the end of the world. End quote. We are talking, of course, about the plague that would become known simply as the Black Death that swept through Europe in the Middle Ages, killing somewhere between 75 and 200 million people. At the time, that was 30 to 60 percent of the population of Europe. Imagine it for a second. Imagine your family and your friends and the people you barely know anything about from the guy who runs the corner shop to the teacher you disliked in primary school. Everyone you know. Now imagine a third of them, half of them, dead in the space of a few years, dying in a horrible, protracted, vicious and painful way, and leaving behind chaos in society. Now imagine that you had no real concept of what was going on, no knowledge about what caused sickness and what you could do to keep safe. Listen to what Agnolo de Tura is describing. Lots of people thought that the plague was caused by some pestilent fog or the miasma, which in some ways is pretty close to reality. But just as many people thought that they were being infected simply by looking at a victim. Families, so desperate, having seen the suffering and the horror, they were abandoning each other. Like the heart-rending scene in every zombie movie ever, where the hero has to shoot her lover or his father. There's nothing for it, there's nothing you can do. They've been infected. It's too late for them and any ties of love or sentimentality could kill us all. And this was a time when nearly everyone's views about the world were completely dictated by a very dogmatic form of religion. Since they had been born, the smartest people they knew, the authority figures, the learned men of letters, had been telling them that one day God would return his gaze to the earth to punish the wicked and save the righteous. Now, if this is what you believe, and you look around and you see half the population dying, society fragmenting, the end of days. What else could it possibly be except the end of the world? The one you've been waiting for? We have short, short memories as a species, and so we've forgotten almost what it was like to be threatened by mass death from a pandemic like this. The diseases we're used to, especially in the West, are are more of the degenerative variety. Heart disease, cancer. Horrendous and heartbreaking when they happen to the ones we love but unlikely to strike multiple people we know at the same time, unless we're very unlucky. And crucially, this kind of disease isn't infectious. There's nothing like the same kind of fear and terror that arises from this. In the West, it's almost unimaginable, and for most of us, thankfully, our contact with this kind of sickness is limited to a few doses of flu, feeling rotten for a few days, maybe, but not dying en masse. The influenza virus should remind us that even though we now understand that diseases are caused by pathogens, that is viruses, bacteria and fungi that attack the immune system, even though we understand how to kill them and treat and mitigate the symptoms, 
we still can't stop ourselves from becoming infected in the first place, even though we know what precautions to take. In the modern era, we're bound to look on people who suffered from the plague as far more primitive than ourselves, even though outbreaks of infectious diseases still kill plenty of people. And the Spanish flu killed millions in Europe and the so-called civilised world as late as 1919. People at the time of the plague were unsure who to blame. A chronicle from the time gives you all of the mythology and superstition that you'd expect to surround such an apocalyptic event. Quote, In the month of August 1348, after Vespers when the sun was beginning to set, a big and very bright star appeared above Paris, toward the west. It did not seem, as stars usually do, to be very high above our hemisphere, but rather very near. As the sun set and night came on, this star did not seem to me or many other friars who were watching it to move from one to another place. At length, when night had come, this big star, to the amazement of all of us who were watching, broke into many different rays, and as it shed these rays over Paris towards the east, totally disappeared and was completely annihilated. It is, however, possible that it was a presage of the amazing pestilence to come, which in fact followed very shortly in Paris and throughout France and elsewhere, as I shall tell. All this year and the next, the mortality of men and women, of the young even more than the old, in Paris and in the Kingdom of France, and also, it's said, in other parts of the world, was so great that it was almost impossible to bury the dead. People lay ill little more than two or three days and died suddenly. He who was well one day died the next, and being carried to his grave. Nothing like the great numbers of 1348 or 1349 had been heard of or written of in the past. In many places, not two out of twenty remained alive. End quote. The chronicler may not have read of the great plagues of Justinian in the Roman era, or the Antonine Plague, which killed similar numbers of people in the Roman Empire, at least in terms of a fraction of the population. But these plagues didn't bring about the same levels of societal collapse. And yet they were brought about by the same pestilence, the same pathogen, the same disease, Yersinia pestis, hundreds of years apart. And while society has obviously changed dramatically in the years since 1348, one thing that hasn't changed is human nature. And we can imagine that our reactions to a similar apocalyptic event, if it happened now, wouldn't be all that different. Once the thin veneer of civilization is stripped away, human nature is still the same. We might react in the same way. After all, when things go wrong, don't we still cast around looking for people to blame? Jean de Venette, who survived the plague in France, said, quote, some said that this pestilence was caused by infection of the air and waters, since there was at this time no famine nor lack of food supplies, but on the contrary, great abundance. As a result of this theory of infected water and air as the source of the plague, the Jews were suddenly and violently charged with infecting wells and water and corrupting the air. The whole world rose up against them cruelly on this account. In Germany and other parts of the world where Jews lived, they were massacred and slaughtered by Christians and many thousands were burned everywhere, indiscriminately. The unshaken constancy of the men and their wives was remarkable, for mothers hurled their children first into the fire that they might not be baptised, and leaped in after them to burn with their husbands and children. End quote. The Black Death changed society in a lot of fundamental ways, such was the death toll. One of the things it did manage to do, although chroniclers of the time didn't always realise it, was fundamentally shift the economy of the Middle Ages. The poorest class actually became wealthier as a result of the pandemic because there were fewer labourers around and because the plague disproportionately struck at the young and healthy. An individual peasant was suddenly worth a lot more to the market and so they could charge more for their labour. A small recompense, you might think, for half the people you know dying in agony. The scars of the Black Death remain on Europe, even today. Aerial photographs can show the remnants of entire villages and towns that used to exist, but were completely depopulated by the plague. The Black Death was an example of a disease that spread via vectors, animals that spread diseases from person to person. In the case of the plague, it was the fleas that lived on the rats that swarmed in the cities, which spread the disease so quickly. And this is a dangerous thing to note. It was the changing living styles and gradually increasing urbanisation that meant you had major population centres in towns like Siena. With these population centres came rubbish and food waste, and with these things came the rats, the fleas and the pestilence. 
It's no coincidence that the plague struck the Roman Empire with its sprawling, cramped cities particularly hard. Changing ways of human life open up new opportunities to pathogens, who long to exploit them. Amazingly, the ancient Romans were probably more hygienic and better practiced in medicine, in some ways, than the people in the West a thousand years later. The ancient Romans loved their running water. Yes, the aqueduct was one of the things they did for us. And they cleaned the filth from their streets. Hot water and bathing regularly, they were the marks of civilization. By our standards, they may have still reeked in the cities, but they were far cleaner than the generations that followed. But by the 14th century, this was no longer fashionable. The aqueducts had been wrecked centuries before by the invading Goths, who likely didn't appreciate the way the water interfered with their eyeliner. Sorry, but not sorry. But the theories about medicine could be counterproductive. Take the theory that bathing in hot water, quote, opened the pores and allowed miasmas into the body. King Henry III's surgeon stated that steam baths and bathhouses should be forbidden. When one emerges, the flesh is softened, the pores open, and as a result, pestiferous vapour can rapidly enter the body and cause certain death. This was written in 1568 and led many bathhouses, which had survived as a luxury in some cases, to be closed. The medical malpractice didn't end there. In the Victorian era, the Great Plague in the West was cholera. Now, I'm quoting here from Sonia Shah's excellent book, Pandemic, where she mostly talks about cholera, but also the risks of future pandemics and how they transfer from animals to humans. And I do recommend it if you get a chance to read it. She says, quote, Cholera took hold of Paris in late March 1832. Without the benefit of modern medicine, it killed half of those whom it infected causing a set of uniquely horrifying symptoms. Within hours, cholera's dehydrating effects shriveled victims' faces, wrinkling skin and hollowing cheeks, drying up tear ducts. Fluid blood turned tarry, clotting in the bloodstream. Muscles, deprived of oxygen, shuddered so violently they sometimes tore. As the organs collapsed in turn, victims fell into acute shock, all the while fully conscious and expelling massive amounts of liquid stool. In the evening, during that terrible spring, Paris's elite attended elaborate masquerade parties, where in defiance they danced to the so-called cholera waltzes. They were dressed as the ghoulish corpses that many would soon become. Every now and then, one of the revellers would rip off his mask, face purpled, and collapse. Cholera killed them so fast, they went to their graves still clothed in their costumes. End quote. And then, the treatment was far worse than the disease. Almost spectacularly a bad idea. They noticed that the effect of dehydration made the blood thick and clotted. But the response was bloodletting, popular to let the bad blood out. Other treatments included inducing vomit, and obviously both of these just deprived the victim of more fluids and made the problem worse. Everyone believed that diseases spread due to bad smells and miasmas. And in a way, you can see why people think this, because the body does instinctively react and feel ill when a rotten smell is present. So you can see why people thought it. Of course, our bodies are in fact conditioned by evolution to warn us about the presence of bacteria, which cause smells and the real damage. But in order to get rid of the bad smells, 19th century high society flushed their waste into the rivers. The same rivers which provided the drinking water and led to the spread of cholera. Listening to this, you're probably convinced that our better understanding of diseases has prevented us from engaging in such stupidity today. And while it's true that we have cures that, you know, actually work, there's still a fair deal of stupidity in the way they're used. A key case study here is the antibiotic. When several different medical practitioners, although Alexander Fleming usually gets most of the credit, noticed that fungi produced a substance that could kill bacteria, It wasn't long before some very clever scientists managed to concoct a synthetic version. Dorothy Crowfoot Hodgkin, the British X-ray crystallographer, managed to establish the atomic structure of penicillin in some groundbreaking research. This allowed it to be synthesised, and it was perhaps one of the greatest gifts that science has given to the human race. She would later determine the structure of insulin after 35 years of efforts in that direction, and she won the Nobel Prize as a result. Penicillin saved millions of lives, but it will soon no longer be effective. The issue is one of evolution, 
As antibiotics are used in a more and more widespread way, any little bacteria that have mutated to resist their effects become more and more strongly favoured by natural selection. Soon enough, the only ones that survive are the resistant strains, and the antibiotic is no longer effective. This is a natural process, so it's kind of unavoidable, but we've made things worse in the way that we use antibiotics. Experts have said that if we properly stewarded it, the substances could have protected us for centuries to come, but instead we take them when they're not really needed, almost as a placebo. We even give them to animals to promote their growth and prevent disease outbreaks in factory farms. And as a result, the efficacy of these weapons has been considerably reduced. Big pharmaceutical companies, although they do some research into new antibiotics, well, they realise that a drug that you take for a few weeks and then stop is nowhere near as lucrative as a drug you must take forever. And so they concentrate their resources in these other areas. And besides, there's only so many antibiotics that will ever be harmful to hurt pathogens without hurting humans as well. There are other ways in which we've rendered ourselves more vulnerable to a pandemic than we need to be. In the modern era, global transportation networks mean that the outbreaks don't have to be geographically limited anymore. In the Middle Ages, a single infected person might infect a few others in their town or village. That's bad enough. But in the modern era... If that person travels through an airport, they could seed simultaneous outbreaks in different corners of the globe. In 2003, this happened with SARS, Sudden Acute Respiratory Syndrome. This is a disease that's mainly found in fruit bats, and actually it was in this rare type of Chinese market called the wet market, where you could get all sorts of somewhat shadily obtained meat and delicacies, where it first spread over to humans. A Chinese doctor who was initially infected stayed in a hotel with many other guests in Hong Kong. The guests themselves became infected, and the disease spread to Vietnam, China, Taiwan, and Thailand. Before too long, it was infecting people in Canada as well. A single source had led to infections across the whole world. The reaction to the outbreak initially was telling. Reports came out of China that they were cloudy, because to avoid panic, specific cases or suspected cases went underreported until the government was forced into disclosing them via media attention. Thankfully, the SARS outbreak was contained by the tireless efforts of the healthcare workers involved, and dozens of doctors and nurses lost their lives containing the outbreak. We should be thankful they did, because SARS could have been a truly dreadful pandemic. We can't stop people from travelling on planes. People have tried to take precautions. Airports have systems that claim to be able to detect elevated body temperature and flu-like symptoms, but I'm sceptical about how effective they are. For a start, a virus can often incubate in the body for a while with no symptoms, and you'd expect a really virulent, really dangerous pandemic to be like this, to have an incubation period before it becomes apparent the person is infected. And secondly, I went through one of these scanners once, and I had a really dreadful cold, and it didn't notice. So that's anecdotal evidence, and probably they're unmanned if there's no outbreak that people are concerned about. But by the time the authorities react and ground flights, it will probably be already too late to prevent multiple outbreaks in multiple countries from taking place. We can't deglobalize the world, but one of the key things to point out here is that the human race as a whole is not responding to potential threats of pandemics in the most effective way possible. Now these diseases, they often arise from places where, due to poverty, or disruptions such as civil wars. The distribution of healthcare is severely disrupted or non-existent. The best chance of fighting some new pathogen is to nip it in the bud, at the place of origin, with a highly concentrated effort. We saw this with the incredible effort to stop the last outbreak of Ebola, which just about managed to contain the disease, although not before thousands died across three countries. Yet the time lag between the first death and the outbreak being reported to the World Health Organization was nearly three months. If there was greater equality in the healthcare system throughout the world, there would not be such a huge risk to our society. In a globalised world, regions that have insufficient healthcare, at least when it comes to virulent diseases like this, there are risk for everyone. Now I'm not saying that foreign aid money is always spent wisely by governments, that's a political issue where I'd have to do a lot more research, but in principle, the price we pay for ease of travel around the world should be making sure that we have a flexible global healthcare system that can find these pandemics and stamp them out before they get too serious, wherever they occur. Either that, or we give up the travel.
You'll probably notice, if you pay attention to reports of viruses in the media, that many of the pandemics that cause the most fear are the ones that are transmitted from other species into humans. Examples include HIV AIDS, which we believe originated in monkeys, and probably spread to the humans that hunted them for bushmeat via the infected blood. Similarly, contaminated meat and blood may be responsible for the transmission of Ebola and SARS to humans. And there was recently a big storm in the media about a swine flu pandemic back in 2011. Before that, people were concerned about bird flu. Why is it that these diseases that jump from animals are such a big concern? As you probably won't be surprised to hear, the answer again is related to evolution. The reason that viruses that transmit across the species are the most dangerous is because they haven't yet adapted to humans properly. For a start, a virus that's transmitting a new strain to humans may well be unstable and prone to mutations. But it's often the very high fatality rate that makes these diseases so scary. For example, rabies, which is transmitted via animal bites, is fatal in nearly all cases unless it's treated. Illnesses like Ebola can kill anywhere between 25 and 80% of people who become infected. Compare that to a disease that's well adapted to humans, like human influenza, that kills maybe less than 1%, and you can see that there's a big difference. Part of this is down to the fact that a new virus crossing over to humans doesn't necessarily have established treatments that work for it, but a big part is down to evolution. Ideally, for the pathogen anyway, a pathogen doesn't kill the host. After all, the host is home to all of those bacteria. The pathogen really doesn't have too much interest in killing its host. Ideally, it uses its host as a means to spread itself as far and wide as possible. It can't do that if the host is dead. That's why mild strains of influenza that cause you to infect plenty of other people, if your boss makes you go into work, for example, they're far more successful and prominent diseases compared to those that kill in 100% of cases. But a disease that's recently crossed over from animals hasn't yet adapted to not kill the host. So the concern is an illness might arise that's both highly contagious, maybe airborne or transmitted from person to person, and highly fatal. And in the first few strains that cross over to humans, you could get both. In the case of a virus like Ebola or SARS, the only reason they're not even more deadly than they are today, and a bigger threat to the species, is that although highly fatal, they can only be transmitted by close contact with an infected person. And because the person is only contagious for a brief time before visible symptoms start, something like quarantine can be effective against these viruses. But nightmare mutations that could render these diseases much harder to combat might be, let's say, a disease that incubates for a long time, allowing people to travel and disperse before becoming contagious. A disease that was contagious long before major symptoms started, well that would make it impossible to quarantine people, who might not even realise that they're spreading a deadly pandemic. And if such a disease could become easily airborne or waterborne, far more contagious and more easily infecting people, then it would also be much harder to deal with. And the mutations that might cause this could occur at any time. When you think about pandemics, you get into this weird apocalypse as an insurance policy type of thinking. Personally, I think the threat from pandemics is a huge argument for giving money to global organisations and charities like Médecins Sans Frontières. Our only hope is to ensure that the monitoring and outbreak control occurs all over the world, uniformly. If a truly nasty pathogen hits, it won't be possible for any one nation to act unilaterally. And what would be the cost of a truly awful pandemic? So if you're looking at the insurance risks, it may reassure you to learn, for example, that recently, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, famous for its skiing and capitalists, World governments pledged $500 million towards developing vaccines for diseases that the World Health Organization has identified as potentially leading to pandemics. Now this has to be separate from the World Health Organization, which can't muster the funds to do their own vaccine research and development on this scale. And also, the World Health Organization can't really do this because it is also the body that assesses whether vaccines are up to scratch, so there's a bit of a conflict of interest in developing the drugs that you're also assessing. So the creation of this independence group to research vaccines and the $500 million in funding. Now this sounds like a reassuring step, until you realise the scale of the problem that we're talking about, and how small $500 million actually could be. Let's take the 1918 flu as an example. Often called the forgotten pandemic, the influenza outbreak of 1918, sometimes called the Spanish flu, although it's incorrect as it didn't actually originate from Spain, it just 
sickened the king of Spain, which is why people thought it came from there. Anyway, the Spanish flu was particularly bad. It killed people by triggering an overzealous response in their own immune system. This meant that the young and the healthy, who had the best immune systems, were hardest hit by the autoimmune response, and they disproportionately died. That pandemic killed 5-10% to of the people who were infected, high enough to be a serious concern, but low enough that the pandemic wasn't self-limiting. It was very contagious, however, and infected 500 million people, meaning that between 50 and 100 million people worldwide are estimated to have died from the 1918 Spanish flu. 20 to 30% of the world's population got sick, and 2 to 3% of them died. Let's say that this is the worst we can possibly expect from a naturally occurring pandemic. That still means that in the modern era, 140 million people could die of such a pandemic. A bit of cheap and cheerful arithmetic suggests that we're therefore spending around £3.50 to prevent each death. And suddenly, it doesn't seem like such a big bargain. If you consider the fact that such an event might occur every few hundred years, then, realistically, this is the kind of thing that's going to happen to us at some point, maybe in our own lifetimes. Now, I'm sick of seeing statistics and human lives measured in terms of economic productivity, but if we're going to measure everything in terms of these stupid yardsticks, let's use it for good as well as evil. As I type this, probably a few weeks back by the time you hear it, there's going to be a big eclipse in North America. The estimate is that due to people watching the eclipse, the economy will lose $700 million in productivity. Now, of course, this doesn't take into account the benefits of people going to see the eclipse and spending money, or the kids who will be inspired to take up science as a result, etc, etc. If you're listening from the US, I hope you got to see it, and I hope you enjoyed it. But the point is that these things, when you apply them to a whole nation, to a whole planet, they scale up in a pretty impressive way. People taking a few minutes out of their day to watch the eclipse that nominally costs more than the amount of money that the world pledged, at least in this scheme, on vaccines to prevent pandemics. Then there's the economic impact of the pandemics themselves. Ebola, as horrifying as it was, killed 11,000 people. The Zika virus, as terrible as it is, has killed far fewer, perhaps a few dozen. Yet each of these has already cost the global economy not millions, but billions of dollars. Pandemics cost $60 billion a year, that's more than a hundred times what was invested towards these vaccines, every single year. And this is without a major global outbreak, a one in a hundred type event like the 1918 flu. If a pandemic like the one I imagined, with historical precedents not so long ago, arose, it would cost us trillions. Economist Larry Summers argues that one of the best investments ever made was in 1938. Then, the US government invested $26 million to help create the polio vaccine. The reason this investment was so good? The vaccine saved $180 billion in expensive treatments further down the road, alongside saving many lives and averting much suffering. Every dollar spent on that vaccine saved nearly $7,000 later on. The solution is obvious, and it's something we really know about for a long time, it's kind of common sense. An ounce of prevention is better than a gram of cure. So if this is such a slam dunk, then why aren't the big pharmaceutical companies doing anything about it? The issue for them is one of profit, as it is for all companies. Yes, the same driver that led Martin Shkreli to jack up the price of his drugs to be completely unaffordable. Big pharma companies don't necessarily want to spend millions of dollars researching vaccines for viruses that may never become pandemics. When a disease becomes famous, like swine flu, the race is on to rapidly develop vaccines against these illnesses, and be the first one with a product they can sell. Indeed, in the swine flu case, they had a vaccine fairly quickly. But the most successful model for disease control would be to keep a small store of vaccines for every strain that could become a threat. And then, if there is a small localised outbreak, you distribute it quickly to the few people who are affected and stamp it out. Now this would work very well at controlling diseases, saving lives and dollars. But it's a terrible business model. Most of your research and development is for products that never get used. And the vaccines that do get used are ideally only used on very small numbers of people. So it's clearly better to focus your research budget on medicines that need to be taken daily or weekly by large numbers of people that you can sell for a similar amount as the vaccines. I don't want to bash Big Pharma too unnecessarily. They're not doing anything evil per se, 
It's just the correct and profitable thing to do, not to focus on vaccines that might never get used. If you don't do it, you'll be outcompeted and your company will fold. It's just an example of how unfettered, unlimited capitalism is terrible at solving certain kinds of problem, in the same way as totalitarian state control of everything brings about its own problems. But I think there's a good argument that the amount we spend on these vaccines should be brought into line with the ridiculous military budgets that exist in some places in the world. So in the US, $1.4 billion a year gets spent on vaccine research and development every year. Half of that they make back from the sales of the vaccines, and another chunk comes from the venture capitalists. So taxpayers contribute around $500 million a year. The US military budget is over a thousand times more than that, and far more people die of preventable diseases than military conflicts. Now you might say... That's only because the military is so well funded that we don't have any major conflicts. And sure, maybe you can put it like that. But I just want to have a world where we can say the same thing about diseases which could be vaccinated. Thanks for listening. This was the first of a two-part series about the apocalyptic risk from pathogens, viruses, bacteria, that kind of thing. This is dealt only with the naturally occurring ones, because in the next episode, I want to get onto the threat of biotechnology the possibility that humans could engineer a virus even more deadly than the ones I've talked about. And that can get really sinister. In the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed listening to these Teotihuacan specials of physical attraction. We're getting towards the end of our list, and things are getting more and more apocalyptic, but I hope you're still enjoying it. If you have any comments, questions or concerns, you can email us at physicspod.outlook.com. Hit us up on the Twitter, we're always there, that's active, at physicspod. Shortly I'm going to be announcing ways that you can help to support the show, and uh, if you're interested in that, then please let me know. Um, Aside from that, stay safe. You better make some preparations, there's no time. Our theme music is Get Ready for the Apocalypse by Astrometrics. Get ready.